if you have your copy of God's Holy Word, I invite you to turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 will be in verses 10 to 12. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and he hear, his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So ends the reading of God's only sufficient, certain, and infallible standard of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. Let's pray, brothers and sisters. Magnificent Father, our author of mercy and grace, we gather in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to drink again for the well of this living word. Oh, Lord, for whatever reason you've chosen, you give us six days to do in the week all that we must do, but on the seventh day, we must gather to be renewed in the Spirit. I pray for the lost who hear this message today, that they would be drawn ever closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, perhaps even saved. I pray for the beloved gathered here today, that the wisdom of your word would abide with us as we abide with Christ. Even in our failings, O God, preserve your people by your powerful hand. hand. <coughs> I pray for the preacher of the word that your Holy Spirit would aid and guide all that is said and spoken from your word for the blessing to the one who preaches and blessing to the ones that hear. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, uh, here we are in Peter. It's a saying from Peter. And it's always important when he refers back to other scripture, of course, the Old Testament, that we understand his audience a bit. And for, for those of you who haven't been with us in his series, uh, Peter's talking to Jewish believers. Jewish believers that have been dispersed away from Jerusalem, likely residing in what we call modern-day Turkey, foreigners in a foreign land. And they longed, as most Jews would have done at the day, uh, to be returned to Jewish lands and Jewish rule. And uh, even ethni eth ethnically, in that sense, they would have desired that. These are converts to Christ. And this made them an outcast among their own people. A hard blow, really, to be a foreigner in a foreign land and in with your own group. It's fractured a bit. Their countrymen, uh, to them, they were as tainted as perhaps even a Samaritan woman at the well. And so the Jewish identity was a bit fractured, where Peter cites these old writings uh, where he does so. He does it to show them the truth of God's word as it was intended to be read and understood and applied to them as they believed upon Christ. And he takes them, in this case, to the 34th Psalm. The, song, the Psalm of King David. And he's using this Psalm as a way of bringing to completion his teaching that we heard in 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9 that culminated in his teaching on Christian virtue. In doing so, he's showing the continuity of the wisdom of God's word throughout the ages. And that word is finding its resting place in the person and the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I think it's helpful, since he appeals to Psalm 34, that we get a little bit of background on Psalm 34 and understand why is he quoting this directly the way that he is. The Psalm uh, 34 is an acrostic poem. 22 verses that begin each with uh, one letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, uh, Dalet, He, and so on through the 22 verses. And it, the type of structure is meant to be a memorizing aid. That's what some think. I think it, it is exactly what it is, a memorizing aid for the scriptures. Because our English translations lose that, mo that mnemonic device, of the acrostic, we also tend to lose the flow that naturally would go there if we were a Hebrew person and uh, um, uh, hearing that. And, and we would also lose the memory aid of it built into it. But the Hebrew hearers of the word are intimately familiar with this uh, psalm, a psalm that could be sung uh, maybe not quite equal. I mean, we say ABCs, we sing our ABCs, uh, and that helps us, but it's the same idea. You know, it helps us memorize. A psalm that showed the extreme length that David would go through to ensure that he would fulfill 
the calling that life had put or that God had put upon his life. In this psalm, it harkens back to a time where David, before he is that king, is fleeing the wrath of King Saul. And he went before the, Kil the Philistine king Ashish, king of Goth. And David pretended to be insane <laughs> as he frothed at the mouth. Now, 1 Samuel 21 uh, gives us a recall of the events. Uh, chap chapter 21, verses 10 to 15. I want to read that for us, and then we'll get into our teaching today. It said, As David rose and fled that day from Saul, and went to Asius king of Gath, and the servants of Asius said to him, is not this David the king of the land? And did they not sing uh, to one another of him in dances? And some of you will remember this. Saul has struck down, struck down his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Of course, that's why Saul's really angry at him. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Asius, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pre pretended to be insane in their hands, made marks on the doors. I'm, I'm assuming that's clawing at the doors, right? of the gate, and let the spittle drooling running down into his beard. Then Asia said to his servants, Behold, you see the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Of course, the story continues. Now there appears to be a discrepancy, perhaps a literary discrepancy in the Bible in Psalm 34 it says, well, you know, that was, it says that he went to visit Abimelech, not Ashish, okay? And I, I don't want us to, to lose it here on that um, when, when David changed his appearance. There's no error. Romans called their rulers Caesars. The Herods came in different lines as well. And it's assumed that Abimelech is a name that could continue as well and be used of Ashish. Really not an issue uh, similar to ruler and king of the era. The main issue that we're seeing in that isn't really about that king. It's about David's preservation of his life. Now, this is an uncomfortable scene. I don't think we want to see King David in this light with spit drooling in his, in his beard and all this incline and acting like a madman. It's, it's really strange. David probably speaking gibberish as he's frothing at the mouth. And then later, of course, he flees to the cave of Adullam. Now, David wouldn't do anything to save his life. I mean, I mean, there are limits. But we know that within the limits, there's at least drooling and acting like a madman and clawing at the gate. So at least that's fair game for David in this scene. Yet he believed, and he did it because he believed that he was to continue on and that he was eventually to be God's man upon the throne. The man whose rule would know no end, who through his line of Judah would come to the promised Messiah. David knew his life had value to it. And I think we ought to talk about our life a bit today, because Peter talks about our life. There's no doubt that in the past few years, uh, you know, we went through the COVID thing. Uh, some are talking about masks again and bringing all that stuff back and uh, mandatory shots and all this business. And uh, uh, anyhow, all that sad story that we went through. Remember the masking mandates in schools and kids were out of school. They were everywhere and they were grumpy. And, and they were, uh, some kids were terribly depressed. There was a, there was a uh, visible rise in self-harm. And, and uh, um, suicides and all these things were going on. And just, you know, generally speaking, in any population, there's always people that are dealing with depression for different reasons. Um, this just made it worse, that's all. But to loathe your life, for a Christian to loathe your life, is a great sin before the gracious God who gave us our life. And so I'm talking to the Christians, our life is very precious. And when we see that preservation of life, it's really, preservation is generally, we would say, a universal human trait. We're going to try to save life. It's only the wicked that don't value life and they snuff it out at every turn. We go to great lengths to preserve life. We help the sick to live a quality of life. That's what we want for them. Our dear beloved Pastor Gary, who, who we buried just this past Monday, um, we did everything, they did everything they could to sustain his life. And Gary desired to live his life. Yet he said, I surrender. Whatever the Lord desires is what I want for my life. And the Lord called him home. But you can you can be assured, Gary loved his life. He loved his life as a pastor, as a husband, and as a father, and a grandfather. And the Lord called him home to heaven. And Gary's death, and we miss him very much, we feel it today, it's just too fresh for us. 
We can still see, though, how precious life really is and how fleeting life can be. So I urge you, brothers and sisters, as we look at this teaching today, listen carefully to the Apostles' words, for they are good for our lives. In his teaching today, we see three key themes that emerge. They're a blessing, a battle, and a benefit. Now, you all know me. I don't normally do that alliteration stuff, so um, there it is. A blessing, a battle, and a benefit. The blessing. Love the life that God has given to you. That's the blessing. And it's right on the heels of verse uh, 9. Love that life that God has given to you. We'll see why that's the case. And the battle to live in your Christian virtues. That's a fight. We'll see that too. And the benefit of having an unhindered prayer life. We don't need a hindered prayer life. We need an unhindered prayer life. So let's take a look at the blessing of loving a life that God has given to you. We're not to despise that life at all. Though many do today. They despise it. To despise the life we have been given is to despise life itself. And as we know from the Gospel of John, in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. That's what Jesus has given us all life. And we are created by Jesus for the purpose of worshiping God. But to worship God, we have to have life in us, a new spiritual life. Jesus taught, I came that they may have life and to have it abundantly. To have an abundant life is to always and be and forever to be connected to the author of life. That's the way you have an abundant life who gives in abundance Jesus Christ. It turns out that a life lived for Christ has with it the blessings that as we taught just a few weeks ago in verse 9, obtain a blessing. And it's leading us to a life that is a blessing because Christ is with us. Therefore Peter says to us in verse 10, whoever desires to love life and see good days. That's what our text is teaching there. This is a true blessing. It's not at all Joel Osteen's your best life now. It's not after that fashion in the line of the cheap imitation prosperity gospel fakes that are out there. Nothing to do with that nonsense. To love your life is to love God who gave you life. To long for good days is to long for Christ-centered days and to live in the blessedness and the blessed will of God the Father. That's a good life. To love God and to live for Christ is a blessing in and of itself. So that no matter the circumstances of our life, let's be honest, they're going to rise and fall, brothers and sisters. There's good days and really bad days. And days we just don't think we can go another step. But if Christ is with us, no matter the circumstances, we can truly claim, He's with me. My life is good with Christ. Paul did not despise his life in favor of heaven. That's not how it worked out. He wanted to be in heaven, but he didn't despise his life. He embraced both his life here, and he longed for eternity there. Remember, if we, we mentioned in this last week, Philippians 1, 21-24, For to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? He said, I, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. And Paul desired naturally to be with Jesus, but it doesn't mean that he despised his life. He saw great value in living our life here for Christ. Of this very subject, R.C. Sproul taught that the tension with the apostle that he wrestled with was not a tug between good and bad. That wasn't the decision. It was between good and better. He was not contrasting that which is far better with that which is bad. That's not the case. He said we're to love life. And we know that it's far better to be with Jesus Christ. That's what all believers are looking to, longing for. We long for the day. But don't be too much in a hurry. When, when God's done with us, when we've run the course of our life, when the work that He's assigned for you to accomplish is finished, He'll call you home. It's okay to want Him to do it sooner than later, especially if you've got aches and pains, right? Like, oh Lord. <laughs> in the hour of His choosing. Though our circumstances, honestly, may be hard to bear, there are some very difficult circumstances that people must endure who are people of faith at times. But we still must love the life that God has given to us. And when we do, we can be sure that good days are with us because Christ himself is with us during our best and the worst that this world has to offer. Now Paul taught us further in Galatians 2, 19 and 20, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. You see, it was a live to God. 
I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live in the flesh by faith to the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This life we live is to be lived unto Jesus Christ. Now, I like to complain a bit when I'm not feeling well. The whole neighborhood probably needs to know if I get a cold or the flu or anything like that. So you can imagine if I were in Paul's shoes and suffered some of the things he went through. Paul in 2 Corinthians 11, 21 to 25, I won't read it, but I'll just fast forward for you. He shipwrecked, beaten, sleepless nights, and cold. Have you ever been cold through a whole night where there was no warmth to go to? And you shivered through the whole night and you begged for the first light to come and that little whisper of, of sunrise coming because there was your salvation coming when you warmed up. How about thirst and beatings and robberies? Yet God allowed that brother to go through all of that that he could suffer for the sake of the gospel, that it would go forth. We could despair in our troubles. And I think on some level we do. And then we remind ourselves that we are of Christ. Paul trusted in Christ, who called the man to suffer much for the cause of Christ. In our sufferings in life, we're told by Peter right here, you need to maintain your Christian virtue. It's going to matter how you live in these most difficult moments. Because we can quickly lose sight of the Lord when we're losing our minds and things aren't right, when we're put to the test. One way you can love your life, even in times of hardship, is to be grateful to God for your life. This is a, one of what I call my wider context. I don't do them often. But if you'll turn to 1 Thessalonians 5.18 for a second. I, I want to tie this to the idea of loving your life. It's not an immediate context, but it is certainly wider, and it, and it, and it will support the idea here. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Be grateful. Be grateful. I suggest if you have not done so, maybe ever, try it. Uh, write down on a piece of paper things that you're grateful to the Lord for. And let's just focus on your life for a minute, since that's what Peter's talking about right now. Let's bring it to that context. Write down, thank you, Father, for my life. My life matters to God. Thank you for my life. Thank you, Father, for your provision in my life. And we could say, well, someone's got more than I have. Thank you for what you've given me. If you are hungry, thank Him for the small joy He brought you in the midst of your hunger and the next meal you received. When you were cold, as we just mentioned. <laughs> thank God for the next time you're warm. Thank God for His saving grace in your life. Thank Him for Jesus Christ in your life. Thank Him for the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Give Him thanks. Thank God for His power to keep your life. It is in His hand. Some of you are going to get promoted. Well, maybe you will. The country's going a little crazy. If you get promoted to a prison ministry because you get arrested and uh, you get sent there for being a divisive citizen, thank God for your new ministry. It's wide open field in there. <laughs> but should he require the very most of your life and you see the end coming and you can see it, thank him for the life you've lived and the eternity that you're about to live. If you have that blessing. I think we get out extensively to that list. I had a friend of mine used to send me his gratitude list weekly and, uh, and it ceased after he passed away. But I will point out that the next verse in Thessalonians 5, notice that it goes, don't quench the spirit. How about that? And, and so that immediate context right there we, we could really say that if we're not able to even give thanks in these things, that's a way of not having any gratitude and quenching the Spirit. We're going to be careful about that and avoid that at all costs. We are to be the grateful people of God, seeing the value of our lives and desiring to see good days, which are really the days that we have in Jesus Christ, where God delights in our lives. And we come to a practical section of our sermon now that involves our actions in the world. And this is tied directly to what we taught in verses 8 and 9. 
It's our second major heading. It's that we have a battle to live in our Christian virtues. We're going to live in our Christian virtues. Generally speaking, to see good days as we live for the cause of Christ, we're to have what verses 8 and 9 say. Okay, so that gives us a positive list. Unity of mind, sympathy, and brotherly love. That's good days. That will bring, that, that's a good day. We're in Christ, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. And we're not to repay evil or revile in kind. And I'll be honest with you. I know I would shake my head and go, that's good advice. But my natural default is not that. I got that flesh in me, that, that flame on thing that happens. You know, you know, it rises up for whatever reason. So I have to combat this. It's a battle. We have in each one of us the ability to not live in our Christian virtue. And we don't even really have to think about it. In fact, we might have to think about, I better, whoa, better tone this down. That's why God gave me a wife. She would tone it and say, Paul? You know, that was like, hey, hey, whoa, whoa, settle down. You know, that was, uh, he's too angry now with the kids. When I was a young Christian, I was surprised how quickly my mouth would betray my faith. It was amazing how fast that would happen. One man said to me, uh, when I was... We had a chaplain visiting. Uh, I was a tech that worked at the SEAL team. So not a Navy SEAL, but I worked there. And the Navy SEAL chaplain came over, and the guy was just shocked. He said, do you know how you, just, do you talk like that in front of chaplains? I, I wasn't even aware. That's how my mouth was still continuing on as a young Christian. And uh, uh, God fortunately changed it for me. It's a battle. Vitriol and cursing used to come easy. And I became, to be quite honest with you, a bit disgusted about it, broken about it. And, and I, I really sought God about it to change me. Change me, oh God, about this. J.C. Rowell described our pursuit of holiness as a fight. He said it's a fight. And you know, you don't have to go looking for the fight. It's going to come to you. It's like you're walking down the streets in New York City and somebody just walks up and clobbers you. You're, you look, you, don't, you didn't want it, but you're in a fight. And you better fight well if you're in a fight. It's a battle, and it's one that's worth winning. It's one that's worth pursuing. Peter reminds these Jewish converts who would intimately know nothing is changing with God. If you love your life and you desire to see good days, he's telling these believers, hold to your Christian virtues. Now he's going to give us a series of parallelisms, Jewish parallelisms, that are meant to underscore his linking of Christian virtue with loving our life and living the good days. And he uses a series of phrases, let him, let him, let him. Three let him's right there in 10 and 11. The first one is in the second half of verse 10. Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And generally speaking, that's really good advice for a good life in Christ. Here is where we encounter the first portion of our Hebrew parallelism. And, and, and I want to tell you why that's significant. <coughs> the form is a synonymous parallelism. And it's meant to say the same thing and then to kind of restate it another way and kind of say the same thing. Um, for great emphasis. That's what it's saying. Really pay attention to this. Let him keep his tongue from evil is the same as keeping his li lips from speaking deceit. Those are two of the same things, just said a different way. In other words, it's a poetic underscore with bold letters. That's how we do it today, or all caps, you know, crazy people with all caps texting. That's, that's probably that right there. Peter continued in verse 11 with our second, let him, let him turn away from evil and do good. You see, keeping our tongue from evil is the beginning. We are to seek positively, to positively live in a righteous way from God. To turn from evil. That's, that's something we are meant to do and do good. Actively turning away from evil is a preemptive at times and conscious choice that we must make. We are to always turn from evil. Herein lies the battle. I don't think we naturally do this very well. I just think that's the issue. That's why we're being told this, right? It's, it's a real thing for us. But we can be taught over time by an ongoing intervention of God the Holy Spirit in our lives, sanctifying us and teaching us as we grow in our faith in Christ. To actively turn away from evil is in line with the metanoia, that meta, the grand shifting of the mind that happens. It's, it's really, we submit to God and He changes our mind. It's the metamorphosis of Romans 12, 1 and 2 and all that that's happening there. 
Let's face it, the evil is there for the taking. It's easy to do evil. It's easy. We don't have to do much except participate in it. It, it comes in the night. It comes when, well, we file our taxes. We're not in tax season right now, in private. It comes to us on the internet. It comes when we can gain financially and nobody knows what we're doing except us. So we've got an underhanded thing that we can do or not do. It comes to us as easy as ABC123. It's that kind of easy. Psalm 37, 27 directly says the very same thing. Turn away from evil and do good, so you shall dwell forever. The prophet Isaiah from our reading earlier today. Wash yourselves. Wash yourselves. In verses 16, 17. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Listen, learn to do good. Why do we got to learn to do good? <laughs> he didn't say learn to do evil, did he? Well, we know how to do evil. Learn to do good. And, and continue to learn. Learn to seek justice. Learn to correct oppression. Learn to bring justice to the fatherless. Learn to plead the widow's cause. But truly, it's God who washes us clean through His Son, Jesus Christ. But we see here the Lord tell His people, as He did on the several days that led up to Mount Sinai. Remember our study of the Decalogue, when the, the Ten Commandments? We were in that chapter prior, in Exodus 19. And we were looking at God's command to Moses. Go tell the people to do this. Remember what he said? Consecrate yourselves. Wash. And then stand at the ready at the base of that mountain. They were to do this over several days. Get in there and scrub and clean and clean. There's something very practical, beloved, about getting rid of the filth out of our lives. Actually, get rid of it. Get it out of your way. Get it out of your lives. If you're told by God to wash your garments, if he said, do that now... I have no doubt you, yeah, we better go scrub the garment there, better get the spot off of it. Yet God's word commands that we turn from evil. And there might be a thousand or more ways we can make a list. I've got to turn from this evil, that evil, this evil, that Oh, there's four, five more over here. I didn't see them all. And I'll be honest with you, that's a bit exhausting, isn't it? How about we flip it around and do it the other way and live in our Christian virtues? We're gonna, we're gonna, he's going to give us a little more clarity here. The ones that I've already read to you, I'll read them again. Living with the long lists like that of the don'ts, the don't do these, don't do these, that's a hard way to live. It, it, it just, something is just off about it. Now we know we're not supposed to do that. So we know that that's true. But if I stood up here as your pastor and said, hey, listen, we got a, a new weekly list of don'ts. Okay, everybody don't do these. All right, don't go, these, uh, uh, don't go to these movies, don't go to these, listen to these songs, don't do these. All right, it's exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> let, let's go to let, let, let's look at it again how about we do these let me remind you verses 8 and 9 from several weeks ago how about this is our list it's very short have a unity of mind in other words value our unity in Christ okay sympathize with one another brotherly love That's a, this is a wonderful list a tender heart and a humble mind and don't repay evil or reviling in kind Okay, I can do that list. That, that, that we can work on. But if we abandon this list, our Christian virtues, I doubt we're going to have any desire to continue on, as he says, that we're to seek peace and to pursue it, or even to do good, that he mentions in 1 Peter 10, 3, 10, and 11. To pursue means to go after it, to go with great effort, to run towards your goal, to stay up late and work hard that you've ensured that you will have it. This is an act of Christianity. It's so easy to be lazy in anything, really. La lazy is easy to do. We'd have to do nothing to be lazy. That's easy. But to live out our Christian virtues, we're going to have to actively, actively turn from evil. It takes work. It's effort. And seek peace and pursue it. So Peter tells us our third let him, the final verse, portion of verse 11 there. And he says, let him seek peace and pursue it. That's our third let him. Now, now let's be reminded, Jesus mentioned something about the peace. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Well, that's supposed to be something we go after because it's from Christ. Earlier in John 14, Jesus said, if you love me, You'll keep my commandments. Well, let's tie that together right here, right now. In our text, in, in verses 10 and 11, we have the apostle. And what is he? He's this sent one from Christ. He brings the message of the Lord. 
He has the inscripturated, inspired Word of God. And he gives us, in the middle of the three let hymns, five commands. We call these imperatives. These are five commands right there, and we've already said them, but let me organize them this way. Commands one, two, three, four, five. Church, this is for you. This is for your pastor. Command one, keep your tongue from evil. This is a command of God for the beloved in Jesus Christ. Keep your tongue from evil. God commands it of his people. Command two, turn away from evil. This is a command for God's people today. Command three, do good. That's a good command. This is a command for God's people. Command four is to seek peace. Seek it. I'll give this to you again at the end if you missed any of these. This is a command of God's people. The fifth command, pursue it. Go after it. Put some effort into it. This seeking of the peace. This is the fifth command of God's people right there. So a short virtue list and five actions. These are our application points. We don't need any more. That's what we ought to do. This is what we need to do. This is, these are the commands. Obey all of these as we live in our Christian virtues. And as if we could opt to go, well, I'm just, I, none of you would do this actively or, or intentionally, but go, I'm going to have a lazy Christian day. I'm not doing any of that. All right. Well, that's easy to do. But if we live in that, and we set these aside, we're not pursuing it. And I think there's blessings that are inherent that begin to fade in our lives. That we just miss out on. This life that's good. That's, that, that we love this life that God's given to us in the blessing of Christ. Perhaps we love our life a little bit less, or we begin to loathe our life. Or our days will be as those who reside outside the blessings of God. Every step heavy. We're like, the peace of God has left me. Where is this peace? Or maybe worse, we've come into the chastisement of God. It's a loving thing that He's doing that. Well, we have much to do as Christians in this life. We're in the middle of a period of church history where we don't think about it like this. We go, I go to church. As did the people 100 years ago, 200, 300, 400, 500 years ago. We must do our part in this period in church history. So we have much to do in our lives in service to the Lord Jesus Christ. And our lives are to be loved by us as we live in our Christian virtue. And yeah, it's a battle at times. But some things are worth fighting for, beloved, aren't they? All right, good. Just not with each other, okay? We have a good reason, uh, the final one given to us in verse 12. And it's a benefit that we would have unhindered prayer. An unhindered prayer. Uh, verse 12 again, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Here it is. And his ears are open to their prayers. You see, that's, that's why we need to do it. But it's not so for the others. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. That's not good. Is it any real surprise to us that God does not hear the wicked? I mean, I'm not saying he can't hear them. But he's not attending to that prayer. His face is against them. And, and perhaps we've been wrongly taught or wrongly led to believe that God's just hearing it all equal. And, it's, and, and, and he's attending to this one as he is to this one. think about this. Have you ever heard a godless person pray? Or the things they write when they go, we're praying for you, and the things they say? It's really weird. They, they, they don't even know our God. They don't know how to pray to God. They have no idea the character of our Heavenly Father or the peace of knowing Christ. So naturally they don't know how to pray. They don't know anything about Christian brotherly love. They, they just don't know how to pray. They may have virtue, but it's virtue that's centered on their own idea of morality Whereas ours is given by the character and nature of God. In stark contrast, God's watchful eye is always upon His people. And His people are the people He has given to His Son out of the world. And no others. That's it. Those are His people. These are the ones who, when they hear the gospel... Oh, they, something happened to me today. You know, I, I heard His name, Jesus, and... Something just delighted in me when I heard that. And, and suddenly they see their, their heart breaking uh, for the guilt and condemnation of their sins. And they know that Jesus is their answer. He's my answer. Not everybody experiences that. They're no longer condemned. They're regenerated and made to be alive in Christ. This is what Jesus does. He saves people from their sins and he gives them a new life. Remember this, for all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ah, not everybody wants to call upon the name of Jesus. 
But God watches over us. If you remember, David says, he's the, he's the good shepherd of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In Genesis 6, 8, Noah finds favor in the eyes of the Lord. And we know that King David resided in the favor of the Lord. When the eyes of God are upon the righteous, they are watchful eyes, eyes that look upon the servants of God with favor. Now we're talking about David, and we'll talk about kings for a second. The kings of Israel, they all did evil in the eyes of the Lord. The kings of Judah mostly did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Only a few did righteous. As did many of the people who followed after them in Judah and Israel. As do many people today. As do many who call themselves Christian. As do and did many in this day in Peter's writing to them. Be careful. You're the beloved of Christ now. You are the servants of the Most High. God watches all things, and He delights in the righteous acts of His people that are done in His name. Our prayers before the Lord are not hindered, and that is the great benefit to us when we live in righteousness and we actively turn from sin. We're the ones who pursue peace. God hears our prayers. Now we have a great example of David in both the, the positive and the negative. 1 Kings 15.11 tells us this, Because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Well, that's good. And did not turn aside from anything he commanded him all the days of his life, comma, except that little thing with Uriah the Hittite. That mentions that right there. Except that. That's noted. I'm so glad that that's written down for our benefit, that even a king, even a king under the favor of God is susceptible to this thing called the flesh. A painful reminder to David of God's holy nature and that even the king with such favor could fall to this flesh. And do much evil. David's sinful desire became a barrier to his prayers to God. And so what did he do? He stepped out from under the covering of God. He stepped out. And let's just be honest. He did what he wanted to do. He could have picked any number of things to do. But he did. And he got with Bathsheba those days and weeks. We all possess that in us. This horrible ability, and, and to be honest with you, it ought to terrify us a little bit. It ought to be unsettling that that, that remains in me. That there's a force working its way to have its way in me. It's the sin crouching at the door that God warned so many centuries ago to Cain. The remaining desire for sin that abides with us, this side of heaven. And there has to be an answer from God's word. There must be, to avoid such folly, to keep your prayer life intact. Well, there is. <laughs> and if at any point we head down that path, and we can go down that path, any point you feel tempted, just to kind of whatever it is that draws you, it's different for each person, that you know is leading you to sin against God, Anytime you're heading already in that direction, you're already on the sin bus, okay? You're already heading down that path. Anytime the mind has already gone there and you've taken that first step, I'll just remind you, there's the mercy of God every way down that path, maybe even at the end of it. You're meant to take the exit ramp and not continue down the pathway of corruption. We're reminded in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 that no temptation is overtaking you. Except that is, that is not common to man. And here's the beautiful words. God is faithful. We need to know that. Because we're not. God is faithful. When we're not. And He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation. The temptation, by the way, it's not unique to you. But look what it is. He will provide the way of escape. That is unique to you. In that very specific moment. A provision of God who is faithful. So take it. Learn to take it. Anywhere. Anywhere down that path. Take that exit. That you may be able to endure it. The answer to the flesh is to live in the spirit. And we best do that when we pray to God. In the midst of our troubles. And take the exit ramp. The remnant of sin. Working in us is the thorn in the flesh. It's the things that we win silver in our private prayers. The thing that we long to be free of. You know some of you know Johnny, Johnny Erickson Tata. She said one of her greatest reasons for desiring to be in heaven is, I've already mentioned it earlier, she said, I'm no longer going to sin against the Lord. 
She just wants to be free of that. She just, she, she's a quadriplegic. You, you think, well, I want to run and I want to jump. No, she wants to be free of sinning against God in the body and to feel what that's like. A friend of mine told me the very same words the other day. Present and active sin, it's continuous in the flesh. Uh, these things that rise up again and again in our lives, well, what do they do? They're, they're hindrances to our prayer life. They, they hurt it. We know that. We're not praying to God if we're actively pursuing that, right? Now, we sin in the body. We sin in our thoughts. And we've mentioned some body parts. The tongue and the lips of the Christian are not to do evil or speak deceit. But they tend to betray us in the moments. What comes out of our mouth to be an offense against the living God. But when it comes to God, notice that the, the body parts are a little different. His eyes, his ears, and his face. These are classically understood as anthropomorphisms, meaning that God who is spirit is, is being described in these body parts of humanity. He really has no body parts. These are types of saying that, that is a condescension of God that we might understand some truth about this God. And here's the truth. In this case, they tell us of the attentiveness of God for his people as he actively, he actively watches over us and cares for us. God hears us, beloved, when we pray in humility to our Father in heaven. But he certainly sets his face against the wicked. As we close today, we have the blessing of living a life. Please don't despise your life. And if, if you have been, if you've despised your life, just repent of that and ask God to teach you to live in this life in ways that are pleasing to him. But a blessing to live a life that has been given to you by God and unto Christ. We have a battle to live in our Christian virtues and so love the life that we've been given. It's meant to be an abundant life no matter our circumstances. And we are to have the great benefit of an unhindered prayer life. Your prayers do need to be heard by God. So humble yourself. Even if you've gone down that path of Seven steps down the ten-step path of sin. Just pray at any point. Get, get with the Lord about it. But God will turn his face away from the wicked. We know this. Now, as I close, I'll, I'll say these last five commands. I told you I'd remind you of them. Keep your tongue from evil, church. It's very important that you do this. Every time I see a Christian speak evil... It breaks my heart to, to, to see that. Turn from evil. It's even worse when Christians engage in evil. and They go from speaking to engaging. And our, our, our third command, do good. That's living righteously in, all, in the ways that Peter listed. Brotherly love, sympathy, understanding, humility. Uh, seek peace, the fourth command, and pursue it. Amen, church? Amen. Let's pray.